That's the greatest blessing in the world, having a wife like mine. Amen. I want you to all turn to Job chapter 1. I'm going to get there eventually. We've been singing about the blessings of God and the wonderful things of God, and I'm going to preach about the trouble. Um, about a year ago, I put this sermon together, and the first time the pastor asked me to preach, it was too long. And I said, I can't preach it with two other guys even preaching a short sermon. So I made up a whole new one for that one. But this one sat in a notebook in outline form for over a year. And at first I thought, I don't want to preach this. It doesn't sound good. I don't see the word of God coming out of it. I don't see anything encouraging coming out of it or good. Uh, I don't want to preach this to Cornerstone Baptist Church. I don't know if pastors ever felt that way, but I just felt like, no, this isn't right. And so I just left it in the notebook. And then God brought the story of Job to mind. And I thought, oh, well, it is biblical. I can preach what's biblical. And then as things continued in my experience with doctors and hospitals and family and this church, God brought more and more into my life saying, you will preach that sermon. So here I am. Uh, why do you have trouble? Job had trouble. Uh, my daughter and I and my wife often have discussions on Sunday lunch. We'll either go to a restaurant or we'll go to my house and eat and we'll discuss what pastor preached. Usually it's very encouraging because we think about what he said that was positive, something encouraging or something we need to do. And so when I thought about that, I thought about my sermon that I have to do something like that too. We often have trouble because we disobey God. Uh, if you're at Job, well, let me pray first because I Definitely do not want this to be of me, but of God. Father, we are thankful that we are here. We're thankful that we're around your word. Help us, Lord, to see the benefit. Help us to be encouraged by you and your Holy Spirit. Help us to learn, Lord, that we can trust you and, and worship you in every way, whether it be good or bad. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Here in the first verse, it says, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, that's the biblical description of Job. That's not his own saying, hey, look what a good guy I am. That's what the Bible is saying about him. He was a good man. Oh, that thing's always doing that. <laughs> he was a good man and he was perfect and upright. He hated evil and he loved good, which means that most of the time he did the right thing. Now, he's not perfect in that, you know, anybody's perfect. He was a sinner just like us. But yet, most of the time, he was mature and doing that which was right. And God was pleased with his life. So much so that the devil came up before God. That's funny. The devil came up before God and God said, Hey, you false accuser, you liar. Have you thought about my servant Job? And God lays before Satan in verse 7, The Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. He'd been all over the place. And the Lord said unto him, Satan, hast thou considered my servant, Job, that there's none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? In other words, God is saying, hey, Satan, have you thought about Job, my man, my servant? Have you thought about him, what a good guy he is? And Satan answers him. And then Satan answered the Lord in verse 9 and said, Doth Job fear God for or not? He has a reason. He gets a benefit out of it. 
You're being good to him, so he fears you. You bless him, so he's going to obey you. You know, like those preachers on the radio say, send him money and God will bless you. That's what Satan was saying about Job. The reason he blesses you is because you're blessing him. And so he's just paying you back. But Satan, God challenges him and says, no, wait a minute. No, that's not true. Job loves me. And Job's my servant. And he's good and perfect and upright. And Satan says, oh, let me at him. It'll be a different story. He'll deny you. And Satan, and God says, go ahead. Do all you can do. Just don't touch his life. It's mine. And Satan does all kinds of things. He takes his cattle, slays the servants. He brings fire from heaven and burns up the sheep and the servants. He takes the camels and the servants. Wind destroys his house. That's not so unusual. In Florida, we have hurricanes do that all the time. Job's response is in verse 21 and 22, what a man. Job says, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. When I was 11 years old, I accepted Christ as my Savior. I thank God I was saved at such a young age. I went to public school. Oh, there's all kind of crazy people there. But I had God in my heart. I read my Bible, and I read books about the Bible, and I went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And God was in my heart and in my head, and he protected me. And I got through all that. And when I was done in high school, I said, I want to go to college. Oh, my God. Guidance counselor said, go to this one, go to this one, you're so smart. This state school and this state school. I said, no, 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 I want to learn more Bible. I picked a Bible college. You know how God led me? The college was free. All I had to pay was room and board. It was only $60 a month. The tuition was free. I went there for three years. I majored in theology. And when I graduated, I found out that God is in control of everything. That God is all powerful. That his thoughts and his ways are above our thoughts and ways. It says that in Isaiah 55 and Psalm 73. So what do you do when you're in trouble? My brother gave me a verse. My brother's a Christian too. I was saved first. Then my mom and dad were saved the same day. My sister a little bit later and her husband. And my brother a few years later. The whole family saved. We're all going to heaven. My mom and dad are already there. My sister's already there. What do you do when you get in trouble? My brother gave me a verse. He said, when you go to college, memorize this verse. You're going to need it. He was right. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Boy, I learned that verse. I memorized it, and when I was in college, I said it to myself again and again and again. And after I got married, I said it again and again and again. I came home for a year and worked on the railroad for a year. And then my wife and I got married, and I moved to Florida, and I worked in a Christian school, teaching in middle school, math. Boy, I used that verse again and again and again. What do you think when you're in trouble? God's in control of everything. You can blame God. Yeah, you can. All Job's friends blamed Job. They said, you got sin in your life. That's your problem. You stop sinning and God will bless you. That's not true. Job wasn't sinning. He told them, I don't know of any sin in my life. If I did, I would quit, but I don't know of any. So I'm not quitting anything I don't know about. 
And so God wasn't punishing Job because of sin. <laughs> Job's wife came up and said, why don't you curse God and die? Oh, I thank God for my wife. She would never say that. My wife would say, pray about it. Read your Bible. God will take care of it. Thank God for my wife. Amen. She's right. Trust God. Pray. The first thing you should do when you're in trouble is pray. There's a verse in the Bible that says, now it slipped my mind. I've been rehearsing it all week long. About, yeah, when you really need it, it suddenly disappears. There's a way that appears right in the man, but the ends are out by the way of sin. That's not the verse I was thinking of, but that would apply. Uh, you do something wrong over and over and over again, God may punish you. He that cometh to uh, do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And God will chastise you. It says in the book of uh, Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 4, that God chastises his children. If you're in sin, God will let you know and chastise you. But he does the same thing that the fathers do. I never, I have four children. I never paddle my children not letting them know why I was paddling them. What good is that? They mouth off to me and I paddle them. What is going to happen? They'll mouth off to me again. But if they know they're going to get paddled for it, they won't do that. You let them know. God lets you know when you've done something against him. He will chastise you with your knowledge. So, if you have trouble in your life, the first thing you should do is pray. Ask God. Maybe he's chastising you. Say, God, why are you punishing me? Now, don't do it a smart-like attitude. That doesn't work with your children. Why is it going to work with God? But it was sincerity of heart and love for God. Say, God, why is this happening to me? Are you doing this? Is something wrong in my life that I need to change? I want to change. I want to repent. I want my life to count for you. God will show you. That's one. Job showed his character. He was perfect, upright, feared God skewed evil. Satan showed his character in verses 8 and 9. He was a liar, an accuser, a deceiver. He's still that today. He hasn't changed. He had all those troubles come on God's life. Is God responsible? God did it. But God allowed it. Satan did it. Satan was allowed by God to do it. If there's trouble in your life, is God doing it? Pray. Find out. If he is, ask him why. Repent if it's sin. He'll show you. How? You come here and hear the preaching? Oh, Brother Rosser will point out your sin. Your devotions will point out your sin when you read the Bible. Is there trouble in your life? I remember three distinct troubles that came in my life that were what I might call devastating. The first one came the first year I was teaching. I married my wife. We moved to Florida. We both lived in Pennsylvania. I had been working there on the railroad. I got a job in Hialeah, Florida, teaching in a Christian school. So my wife and I said, I got a job, let's go. We got financial support. We can live there. She got a job there. She was going to be this fi uh, the secretary to the principal. Hey, this is great. We're both working. We're both making an income. Came up February, my supervisor came up to me. He said, I want to tell you about next year what we're going to do. We're changing the math department. We're going to give you the special ed kids. I thought, great, I, you know, I can teach my own curriculum. 
I can work with these kids. And he said, we'll give you a Bible class with that group too. And I thought, that's great. My major is theology. I'll be teaching these kids the Bible, and they need it. They need help. They need encouragement. This is great. And that was in February. I thought, boy, I got something to prepare for. Two weeks later, he called me in his office again. He said the school and the church had a budget meeting. And the budget said we're out of money. We're laying off all the first-year teachers and all the first-year employees. At the end of school, your wife no longer has a job. At the end of school, you don't have a job next year. Oh, no job. No job for me. No job for my wife. How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to buy food? My parents were in Pennsylvania. I was in Florida. There was nobody even to live near me that I knew. What am I going to do? That was Wednesday. Isn't it amazing to remember what day it was? I went to church that night. That's why I remember what day it was. And as I was sitting there listening to my pastor preach, I didn't hear a thing he said. He got to the end of his sermon, and I went forward, and I prayed, and I said, Lord, I don't know what happened. I lost my job. I didn't do anything wrong. I lost my job. What am I going to do? And God gave me a peace. I don't know how he did it. I didn't have the promise of a job. I didn't have the hope. I didn't have an idea where to look, but I got up off my knees and I went home and I was like, it's okay. It's okay. I remember when I was working on a bridge, the Courtney Campbell Causeway, I was helping tie steel on that bridge. And I remember one guy came to work late one hour. And he came up there, you know, and we were all working and tying steel and we're sweating. And he come on the bridge, I'll get to work, you know, and he started working. And the boss went over and said something to him. And then he came back over, and the boss was working with me. And so we were working again. And about a week later, the guy came to work two hours late. And the boss went over and said something to him again, came back over to me. I don't know what he said to him. The next week, the kid came to work at lunchtime. We're all sitting under a piece of plywood eating our lunch in the shade. And here comes this guy, and he says, I'll work through lunch to catch you up. Like one guy's going to catch up the other six of us. He went out working on a bridge. And we all sat there and ate our lunches. And when lunch was over, the boss went out and said, you're fired. He had a reason to fire him. He had no hope of going to God and saying, God, I lost my job. Can you help me? I did, because they didn't fire me because I was a bad teacher. April, finally, I got an idea where I might go and find a job in Oniko. I don't know if any of you know, there's a Christian school in Oniko, and that's down by Sarasota, Bradenton. So I came up there looking for a job. I stayed at my sister's house. My sister lived in Clearwater. I went to Oniko looking for a job, and I talked with the principal, and he said, I'm not going to be here next year, so don't, I can promise you a job, but I won't be here. He said, I'll tell you what, go up to Riverview. There's a school there called Providence Christian School. Go there and ask them. They're looking for a teacher. So my wife and I got in the car, drove up 301 to Providence, talked to that principal. He said, be glad to hire you. He told me two more schools in Tampa. But I was getting so sick while I was at Providence. I could hardly hold my head up. And my wife said, we better go back to your sister's house. So we skipped the other two schools. I ended up working at Providence for 18 years. You know what God did with me there? I taught in a deaf school for six years. I worked in a deaf ministry, and I was a deaf pastor for a year. I got a job in a public school interpreting for the deaf because of the training and the practice I had in that school. Now I'm here. The second thing that happened to me that I think was troublesome in my life, I was here. I was actually working in Houston County as an interpreter, but it was Martin Luther King Day, so I had the day off. 
you know what every good worker does on his day off? Sleeps in. I was sleeping in. I got a call on the phone. It was a police officer. He said, my wife was in a wreck. My wife was a nurse at the time, and she worked at a hospital on Highway 50, Oak Hill. And she was at the red light trying to turn with a car stopped in front of her and a car stopped behind her. And somebody went down in the ditch, which was grass back in those days, and came up flying out of the ditch and ran over my car with my wife in it. Broke five ribs. Took her to the emergency room. She was there for five days. She was in hospital for eight days. I got the phone call saying your wife was in an accident and they took her to the hospital. What hospital? I don't know. I'm thinking the hospital she works at, Oak Hill. I called there. No, she never showed up for work. Well, I said she was in an accident right in front of the hospital. Well, they wouldn't bring her here. We're not a trauma center. They probably took her down the road. So I'm calling a couple other hospitals, and I finally found the one that has helicopters. And they said, yeah, she landed it here. So I ran down there. There she was in the emergency room. She looked terrible. She felt terrible. I stayed there with her for eight days, all day long, went home every night. They wouldn't allow me to stay. She was so bad that when she wanted to sleep, she had, a, you know, the table she got in the hospital? She laid over that table so she could sleep. She couldn't lay back in the bed. She couldn't lay on her side. She couldn't lay on her stomach because of the five broken ribs. She laid on that table and slept. That was hard for me to handle. I saw her in such pain, pain that I couldn't take for her. I couldn't say, God, give it to me and let her go. I mean, I prayed that, but God doesn't usually work that way. Sometimes he does. He did in that time. It's hard when somebody else is hurting and you can't do anything but pray. The third thing happened, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because two summers ago, I was working in a summer camp for the deaf. It was called Spiritual Leadership Camp. It was in uh, Polk County. Now, originally, it was Hernando County, and I helped start it. I had a couple deaf workers that contacted me and said, can you help us find a camp in Hernando County? Because normally they were up in Tennessee or New York or Carolinas. And I said, sure, I can get you started down here. I got them started down here for a couple years. I just went there. My daughter Mary Ann went with me a couple times. Just sat around and watched what they were doing. Most of the people there I knew, many of them were my students of the past. Many of them are deaf preachers that I know. And it grew so big, it wouldn't fit in Polk County anymore. So they moved it or wouldn't fit in. Hernando County anymore, so they moved it out to Polk County. And they called me up and said, would you come and teach and preach? I said, sure. Be glad to do that for a week. They said, yep, need you for one week. Come and do that. So every morning, I was preaching to deaf boys, young boys and teenage boys. <coughs> Every evening, once in a while, not every evening, but once in a while, I would preach to everybody. All men, no women were there. And at lunchtime, the deaf leaders would come up and talk to me. I knew them all. They all knew me. And they would ask me questions like I was a know-all wisdom. And I'd give them the best answers I could. God blessed me with wisdom that way. I had one deaf man come up to me, a very young man that I taught when he was a teenager. He brought his nephew up to me. His nephew was hearing, but he knew sign language. And he said, will you lead my nephew to Christ? I'm like, you want me, a hearing person, to lead your nephew, who's also hearing, who knows sign language, to Christ? You trust me, a hearing person? Most deaf people don't trust you. You're hearing. He trusted me. He asked me again, 
I led the boy to Christ. What a blessing. Amen. Every morning I was there, I had every day I had a chance to talk to deaf leaders and help them. They had questions about their ministry, questions about their family. Most of them had hearing families, so I knew the answers. They said, you're hearing. Why do hearing people think this way? Because we're hearing, we're not deaf like you. That satisfied most of them because they knew I was hearing. While I was there, every morning I got up, I was sick. I was throwing up. I had a headache. I felt like somebody was sticking a knife in my head. I was calling my wife. My wife was saying, this is bad. When I came home, my wife said, you're going to the doctor. Went to the doctor. He said, because my wife, she's saying, you got a tumor or aneurysm. You got to go to the doctor. I went to the doctor. He said, nah. He said, your chances of having an aneurysm or tumor, you can go out there and have a wreck on 50. My wife had a wreck on 50. He sent me for an MRI. I don't know. Some of you know this story already because the MRI, the insurance company said no. Won't pay for it. So my doctor sent me to a doctor for allergies. I got 90 poke holes in my back. <laughs> Big square. And found out I had absolutely no allergies whatsoever. Nice to know. You know what he said? You need to go have an MRI. Okay. Went back to my doctor. He said, if you don't feel better, go to the emergency room. My son heard about it from his mother. My son works as an emergency PA. He come driving up to my house and said, Dad, I'm taking you to the emergency room. Took me to the emergency room. My wife met me there. And guess what? They did an MRI. Guess what? There was a tumor in there. I stayed there over the weekend. We found a doctor at Moffitt. He looked at the MRI and said, yes, that's a tumor. It's got to come out. I had one doctor say, it's inoperable. You can't take it out. You're going to die from it. The doctor at Moffitt is one of the best doctors in the United States in neurology. That's all he does is brain operations two days a week. He said, come on down next week and I'll take it out. Went down next week, stopped at Wawa, got a fruit smoothie, oh, they're good. <laughs> Went into the hospital, they checked my blood, my sugar was too high. Go home. Can't have an operation. So they said, next week. Next week, a hurricane comes through Tampa. They called and said, no operation this week. Come next week. When next week, he took the tumor as much as he could out of my head. Sent me back to the doctor here in Hernando County. And the doctor said, I'll take the rest of it out with medicine, which he has. I've had another MRI, and it says it's gone. Amen. You have trouble? Pray first. Pray. Why? Pray. Ask God. Pray. Sometimes God wants somebody else to see your trouble and see how you're going to act. And then God says, look at them. And they look at you, and they say, oh, God's in their life. That's what I need in my life. And then two, trust God. Trust God with all your heart. You know, one of the amazing things is me going to doctor and doctor and doctor and doctor. And they say, the last time you were in the hospital, you know when the last time I was in the hospital? I was three years old. I never had surgery. Never had any major problems. I had a birthday last Sunday. I'm 68. God's been so good to me. 
I think 68, that's nothing. God brought me here. And God's going to keep me going until he's done. Pray. Trust God. Pastor, we need you up here.